Welcome to the podcast. Today, we have Jonathan Asley on the podcast, who is um, a midlife dating coach and is an expert in self-love, so much so that he's even written a brilliant book on the subject. And he's just got lots of great advice for anyone right now. And so it's my pleasure to have you on the podcast. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> really quickly, I'm a dating and relationship coach, mostly for women, but I do help men. I do tend to specialize in midlife, which is after baby making years and before retirement. However, lately, so many 30 year old people have been coming to me for advice because I come at it from like that big brother, big uncle, parental kind of perspective. After turning 40 and going through a divorce, I lost my quarter million dollar a year job. I lost my $2 million home. And I got wiped out in the market crash. I went to bed wishing I didn't wake up. And what I will say saved me was beginning a practice of personal development, self-help, and spiritual work. That's what literally saved my life, amongst some other things. And so as things progressed in life, I suffered one of the worst tragedies anyone could have happened to them. And I lost my 19-year-old son. And during my grief, I said to myself, I have a choice. I can grieve through suffering and pain, or I can grieve through love. And I began a deep dive into what does love mean, both for self and others. And what was birthed nine months after his passing was my second book called What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway? Loving oneself is really taking empowerment in one's life. And so it's a journey of personal development, self-help, and spiritual work. A good framework of lots of things to dive into, really. I do kind of wonder, so... Did you just have like lots of what was technically your money in equity that then all just got like disappeared? How do people like suddenly lose all their money so quickly? So what happened was when my wife and I filed for divorce, at that same time, I lost my quarter million dollar a year job. And that affected my identity to lose the significant job that I have and find myself displaced. And I was going through the emotional effects of divorce and now the emotional effects of losing my job. And at the time we had sold our $2 million home and we split our assets. And so I had roughly a seven figure net worth in my life. And then the market crash hit in 2008. So when I wasn't working, I took my almost million dollars and was day trading and I was highly leveraged. So when the market crashed in three months, I had margin call, margin call, and the funds were just dissipating. And emotionally, I was devastated. And what kind of kept me going was my addiction to online dating. I mean, that's the other piece I didn't share in the book, but I was addicted to online dating. I was addicted to talking to women over and over again. This is what led me to what I'm doing today as a dating and relationship coach. But I lost my money because I, my emotionally, I was devastated and I had my blinders on. I wasn't paying attention. I trusted someone else to manage my money too. And, and they were going through their own stuff. And in retrospect, as I look back, all of these things happened for me, for me. I had to be burned down to the ashes, kind of that Phoenix being burnt to the ground so I could rise up again. And I'll be candid with you, Sam. I led a very egoic, myopic, selfish life up until this point. One of the reasons why we had got divorced was I live life based on greed is good and chase money and everything else is going to work out. And I've, and I've learned since then the value of loving on oneself is the most important asset you have in your life. Self-love does sound a bit egotistical as well. If you're just mm. focusing on yourself and then you're thinking about that. I know self-love is a turnoff to some people. It feels a little woo-woo. Some people mistake it for self-care, which is getting manicures and pedicures and massages, self-care day which, you know, our body doesn't need care. So, I mean, those are important things. Self-love, to make it simpler, is more like self-worth, self-confidence, self-esteem, self-reliance. That's embodied in self-love. Self-love is the empowerment within because love is the most powerful force in the universe. And so most human beings live more in unhealthy, egoic ways, either in unhealthy ego or in fear. And love is the antidote to that. So self-love is more like the healthy ego saying, you matter and, and I'm going to put an and here, everybody else matters too. 
So one of my daily mantras for myself is I'm loving myself and everyone else. And I'm going to answer it really quickly like this. How can you be of value to another human being if you don't love yourself? Because reality is most people crucify themselves emotionally. They beat themselves up emotionally. They don't feel good enough. They don't feel lovable. They don't feel like that's lacking love for self. So like taking care of a small child, self-love is taking care of the little child within you. A lot of people get named narcissist behavior because of their selfish behavior. And the reality is, is human beings are very myopic. Sometimes their only vantage point is self. They're only thinking themselves. And so self-love is embodying the love within oneself so you can actually see the value in other human beings and actually care. And so in the dating process, for example, this happens with men and women alike. You've invested a little bit of time with someone, then you ghost them as an example. Well, that's saying that other person doesn't matter. That's what you're conveying to another person when you could simply say, hey, look, you're a nice person. I feel like we're misaligned. I'm going to go a different direction. But to disappear is not valuing another person. So I'm here to say self-love embodies love for oneself so you can actually have the capacity to love all human beings as our brothers and sisters, rather than a selfish, egoic way of navigating life. Do you think there would have been a way that you could have taught yourself during your first relationship to have learned these things and been able to give better love to yourself yeah. and your wife and things? Yeah, it's interesting because my other son, he's been listening to my rhetoric for a decade or so now. I mean, he's listened to my CDs in the car. And the reason why I bring him up is, and both my boys in a way, is they embody care for other human beings because I instilled upon them that value of honoring who they are. And the one thing I did as a parent is I didn't judge their choices. Sometimes they did stupid things. And as a parent, you know, I could say, hey, look, that was stupid. But I also said, look, I don't judge you for it. I just want you to see where you're coming from. And my purpose for bringing this up is I didn't learn this stuff growing up. I was raised with a lot of childhood wounds and traumas in life, like most of us have, without any real healing from it. So it took my crash, losing all my money to open my eyes to a different way of approaching life. And that's when I got more involved with personal development, self-help and spiritual work, which has been the vaccination to emotional chaos. You seem to feel like that was like a good start up to then like the question of like, how could you have taught yourself as in back when you were putting yourself through the emotional chaos? Could you have said something that would have explained it to you, like the damage you were causing with all those things that like you thought would make you happy, like the greed and things? Or do you think you needed to actually lose it? I sadly believe most of us need a humbling event for that first initial wake up. And sometimes it's multiple humbling events to wake one up to a level of consciousness. So I could have went to a seminar and listened to someone talk about this, and I probably would have still been in my blinders. So sadly, it takes a wake up call for people to actually begin to shift. That's why I shared with my son, because I instilled a level of awareness to him in an early age, because I encouraged it from him day after day, year after year kind of thing that I never got as a child yeah. or as a young adult. So here's the thing with young people. Great wisdom used to be passed down from elders. I think of the American Indian tribes where the elders were the most coveted people from the youngins always wanted to go to the elders to seek wisdom. Nowadays, young people don't seek wisdom as well. their wisdom now because of like technology no. and like new things moving so fast. You kind of feel like they're behind the times. And my dad was that way. I was thinking mm. he's not ahead of me. That's why I'm so integrated to technology. I know more technology than my son. But yeah, life has moved really fast for the millennials, the Gen Zs. And I mean, in relationship to even my generation. And I'm on the cusp of boomer Gen X. I hadn't really thought about it like that as in, we have talked about all the problems that we're causing ourselves with the tech, but we haven't thought about the fact that actually we haven't got so much guidance on how we're using it because we can't really ask our mom about how to like <laughs> date when you're using Tinder because she has no idea how, what to tell me about it. And yeah. It's just like weird. <laughs> and yeah. My parents were the generation of the depression. They actually experienced the depression. And so they kind of approached money from a mindset of scarcity. In other words, they were savers and savers and savers. Then the generation after them and before my generation 
spenders and consumers all the way up until now. And this pandemic is going to be the next wake up call to mm -hmm. less consumption and more introspection and going inward. That is really the potential byproduct of all of this is that happens. I see that as one of the values that can happen right now. Same as you're saying how it took like the major things to shift yourself and improve you. I think it's going to improve society in the long run of posing so many things that are wrong with the way our economies and what we should be doing to sort of really self-love our planet and our species a bit more. One of the principles, for example, in my book of self-love is be a good steward of your money, not mm. self-love. Your body is a machine, not a temple. That's saying my body matters. That's another form of self-love. It's looking at others with a sense of compassion. That's also self-love. So again, I know people get turned off by the term. That's why my book is going to create some clarity on that. But I always think of it like when you're on the airplane and the flight attendant says, in the case of cabin pressure change, put the oxygen mask on yourself first if you're traveling with small children. Well, the oxygen mask is love. And when you look, feed love to yourself, you can take care of that small child, because if you don't, you and the child are going to die. And that's another metaphor for self-love. On this subject, what do you think humanity has been doing wrong? What are the things we should be learning from this pandemic besides the obvious? I like to think of life in the perspective of inner peace. Okay. What's my inner peace gauge? Am I feeling anxiety, frustration, fear, worry, regret, or am I feeling calm, joy, bliss? And so my barometer is how I feel. And my feeling is my center of my inner peace. Awareness is the recognition of this. So having that awareness within myself, I'm able to navigate. So when I'm out of balance, I infuse it with love, meaning I'll mm. read a book, I do meditation, I watch a video as a way to nurture my soul. But it took awareness for that to happen. So my invitation for everyone, that's another component of self-love, is connect with your own heart and begin to connect with others' hearts because that's where the real gift in life is when we connect with others. Sadly, when a person hasn't healed from within, think of avoidance mechanisms, people who drink, people who do drugs, I mean, addiction and whatnot people that have shopping addictions, gambling addictions, sexual addictions, is because they don't feel good within themselves. So at some point, there's going to be a wake-up call. And, you know, here's the sad part. Up until maybe the 50s or 60s, a human discipline was a lot more prevalent. Sadly, most people feel like, you know, they've been so coddled mm. since the 50s and 60s. You know, we haven't been had to deal with real war, real terror and that sort of thing, that internal discipline has gone by the wayside because choosing to make a different change your life requires a level of discipline. You know, you can't read this book and it's going to change your life. You read the book and then begin a daily practice to well, reintegrate your life. What are the problems that people have and how do you solve them? One of the challenges with dating right now is that for the most part, we're meeting total strangers. So one of the challenges is getting to know someone. And sadly, most people's skills in asking really good, healthy, value-based questions is rather weak. And so I approach the dating process from a sense of compassion and intentionality because most people have been so convinced that chemistry equals relationship success. I want to repeat that. They believe chemistry equals relationship success. And what we've learned time and time again, that relationship success is chemistry is important, but we need shared values, blendable lifestyles, and emotional maturity. When I help my clients is get really crystal clear on those other three factors of relationship success. So they spend less time with the wrong guy and actually begin to attract the right guy. So what kind of questions would be good value-based questions? Let me give you an example. You're talking to someone, you're on a date. And by the way, my demographic is that over 40. So roughly 75% people over 40 are divorced. Okay. So I'm going to use this as an example. By the way, this is very conversational. You know, it's not confrontational. It's very, hey, so what happened in your marriage? That kind of sucks that you got divorced. What happened? If the person is pointing the finger at their ex and they basically say, 
The ex did everything wrong and they take no ownership on their part of the ending of the relationship. There's a lot of blame and judgment over their ex. And then every subsequent relationship thereafter, it's blaming the other person. They're pointing the finger and they take no ownership. That's a great clue right there that this person's emotional maturity may be very low because a true emotionally mature person takes ownership on their part of the ending of a relationship. They go, you know what? My ex and I had our differences. I have to take ownership on my part. I was a little bit unconscious in the relationship. I wasn't very attentive. And my partner had her own issues and I out of respect for her, I won't share it. You can see the difference. If I'm blaming the other person, they were a cheater, they were a liar, they were unfaithful, they were abusive in this, pointing the finger versus the way I described it. I take ownership on my part. Emotional maturity is the reason why most people fail in relationship. So if they're not emotionally mature, they're going to be breaking up anyway. When you have two emotionally mature people, it's disaster. I'm just saying, if you're choosing to potentially have sex with someone, then vet them. Stop being so naive, not you. Humans, stop being so naive and say, oh, I can't ask really good questions because it's not fun. The problem with dating is it's more focused on fun and chemistry than it is the real important things. Do we share the same values? Is your lifestyle going to work with mine? Because nothing sucks more than investing in another human being only to have it implode. You know, my parents, they were married 66 years before my mother passed away. She only had one relationship in her life. Nowadays, the average person has had multiple relationships and that affects our emotional well-being. It affects our self-love. In fact, Sam, dating and relationships trigger the number one emotional health issue. And that is, I'm not good enough. So if you have enough, for lack of a better word, failures, your self-esteem is going to be shot. So ask really good questions so you don't go down that path. I'm sorry, I yell when it comes to things like this. The whole interview <laughs> question. Yes, yeah. you should interview them. And Definitely. don't think otherwise, but do it in a fun, playful, humorous way. I'm not talking about confrontation or an interrogation. I'm talking about make it fun. That's what I teach my clients. A quick pause for an ad break. Did you know that PayPal was sold in October 2002 and the co-founders went their separate ways? Elon Musk going into rockets, Peter Thiel into big data, but Reid Hoffman was obsessed with personal networks and hiring. He started building LinkedIn in his lounge and he recruited a few of his friends that he knew were reliable to help him build it. But what happens when you run out of trusted friends to hire? Well. That's exactly where the tool LinkedIn Jobs comes in. 20 years later, LinkedIn is the world's largest professional network with over 875 million users. And LinkedIn Jobs is the only tool that I use because it works so well. You can simply create a free job post in minutes to reach your personal network and beyond. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right candidate that you want to talk to faster and for free. You know that success in 2023 depends on the team members you surround yourself with. And did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers will visit LinkedIn? So post your job for free now at linkedin.com slash growth, G-R-O-W-T-H for people like me that can't spell, linkedin.com slash growth. Post your job for free Terms and conditions apply. There was a really good question to be asking people to, to see how they take ownership. But I was wondering how you could apply that to like a business perspective as in, because you can't really like when you're interviewing someone, ask them, like, oh, so what happened with, with your divorce? Because you want to know if they're like emotionally mature, if you're taking them on to work for you. It's interesting because I'm, I'm reading a book right now. It's called The Partnership Charter. How to start out with your new business partner. Now I'm reading this because I think it'd be a great book for relationships. But what's interesting is when two people choose to be in partnership with one another, it's all about interrogation. <laughs> so I wanna use some of the principles here to apply it in, in the dating realm. But ultimately, personalities are a factor to consider in a business partnership. Certainly the economics are an important part to consider in a business partnership. And let's face it, rock and roll bands are a perfect example. How many bands break up because their personalities conflict with one another? 
Mm. Most of that is because they're stuck in ego and fear and they're not really in a healthy place of self-love. Most of the time when there's contention, it's because they lack emotional maturity and there's focus on ego and fear-based way of living than a self-love-based way of living. Still not sure if I could ask someone in an interview you had a marriage breakup. Wait, wait, why can't you? Like, really, why can't you ask that? It's because you get told off. <laughs> really? So if some, oh, by the way, thank you. Perfect example. Hey, so what, I, you know, I know this might be an intimate question, but you know, what happened in your marriage that caused you to be single? I can't believe you're asking me this question. That's a ridiculous question. I will never answer that question to you. Sam, that yeah, means answer. run <laughs> as fast as you can. I don't care if they're a daydream. They are a nightmare. Someone who lacks the ability to be genuinely transparent over a very benign question. That is not an of offensive question. That's an actual value-based question. Since men are typically the ones who pay for dates, if I'm willing to invest my finances in you and you have a problem answering that question, then you, know, you pay your own date. <laughs> yeah. so I mean, if I did the asking, I'm going to be paying, you know, but like mm. if you have a problem with me wanting to find out if you're worth my time, then A, A, I definitely want to stay away from you. By the way, the benefit of asking these questions too is to see how they react. The other definitely. piece, it's not what they answer. It's how they react. So the ladies are watching this. If guys get defensive, trust me, he's not a good candidate to be in a relationship because if you get in a defensive for a very, for a value-based question, that's asking someone about their values. Let me backtrack. You're trying to get insight into who they are and their values. If someone has a problem with that, believe me, you're going to have frustration all along the way. So. Let's say we've just met and I obviously haven't had any marriages fail. What's the kind of question you might ask me and I'll see if I can answer it. Okay. So tell me about your job. I'd love to hear about what you do for a list. <laughs> oh, my boss is an asshole. You know, the market is down. In other words, what you're looking for is the difference between Eeyore or Tigger. For those who know Winnie the Pooh, Eeyore is the sky is falling. Life sucks. Versus happy, 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 hap. So that actually gives you insight. So how they respond to a simple question about what they do professionally, or even finding out about their family history or where they grew up. These are great questions. And what you're looking for is how do they respond? Are they enthusiastic, engaging? Are they a victor in their life? Or do they have victim consciousness? Everybody's out to get me. Because people, those relationships will implode. Love your energy. It's great. <laughs> well, that's my way of being animated. I hope is, again, shaking people up. Let's say you had asked me that question. I'd like to think that I'm more of a tigger. I've got like energy and I do all this stuff. But when people ask me that question, I often don't know what to answer because I don't want to come across like I'm showing off because of, I could talk about the different businesses I've run and like I've done TEDx speeches and like I've been to North Korea and I've hitchhiked across Kazakhstan and I've nearly died a few times and I, I don't really have a job because I do like five different million things and I'm working on yeah. a different business right now. And you're like, well, do I just sort of hit this random person who's a stranger with the fact that I'm like some ADHD idiot that kind of runs businesses and does like lots of other things and probably won't be in the same place next month. And like, like I don't hey, so sure what to say with that. <laughs> oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. So first off, do you go, you know, I really appreciate you asking that question. That really means a lot to me. So you first honor that they ask the question and you even say, it means a lot to me. You know, you can say something like this, it's kind of interesting because I am in an interesting place in my life and I'm really excited because I wear a lot of different hats. I'm trying on different things in life, which I'm really excited about. I'm creating multiple streams of income. And then you could say, look, I don't want to come across as like bragging here for a second. So if this, if I'm bragging, please tell me, you know, like you actually be a little bit humble in that moment and say, I'm really excited because I got lots of great, you know, irons in the fire. I'm doing this internet-based business. I've got a podcast. I've got my YouTube channel that's growing. And so I'm just really enthusiastic and I appreciate you asking that question. You see how I answered that in a very victor consciousness, very powered way without really being too bragging. And I even said, if it comes across a little bragging, let me know kind of thing. And that kind of tells the person to go, hey, he's just excited. 
I don't know. You tell me, how did that feel the way I responded to you? Yeah, that, that felt really good. I, I think I feel like I should use that more often. So thanks for the uh, tips. The one thing though is I do feel a bit like when someone says, no offense, but you kind of expect them to say something offensive. So if I say, oh, this might sound like I'm bragging, I kind of expect that I'm going to be bragging. I only Good. say it that way. It's kind of honoring that I, I'm aware of how I might be coming across. It's just really demonstrating a level of awareness. When you say no offense, you recognize you're going to offend someone. So I say, look, this might offend you because the no offense is saying, don't get upset by this. Hey, you know what? This might offend you. So please let me know. That's actually being empowered when you say, for example, in that verbiage. There's a great book that everyone should purchase in their life. It's called Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. What's great about this book is that oftentimes people communicate from a confrontational way. And this book actually teaches one to approach it from a self-love perspective, from the perspective of the heart and not the egoic self. And another great book is Dale Carnegie's How to Win and Influence Friends kind of thing. How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, it's Influence People. Only because it's, it's got great content in there from the perspective of recognizing that there's another human being sitting across from you in whatever endeavor, I mean, that you're at and coming at it from a more heart-centered place mm. than a selfish place. Yeah, again, I feel like that title can be a bit different because it sounds like you want to manipulate people when it's actually... No. It, yeah, I know, exactly. And it's, like, it's a really good book. It's like how to respect people and actually earn their yes. respect for being a great human. And you're like, why did you so say that you're like, why did you give a title that sounds so dickish? <laughs> well, sadly, we have to have clickbait, you know, to get people to wake yeah, up, yeah. you know, so nonviolent communication. What does that mean? You know, <laughs> compassionate communication isn't as sexy, I guess. But this book, anyone who wants to be in a healthy relationship, if you want to be in a healthy relationship, you have to buy this book, Nonviolent Communication. I promise you, and you have to make your partner read it. From a dating perspective, if you want to have regular sex with another human being, you want to forge a relationship, then invest in understanding how relationships work. Invest in understanding how relationships work. And sadly, most people are unconscious to even the idea that you can do that. Wait, I can actually design the type of relationship I want by asking for what I want and, and having my partner do the same. Yeah, you can do that. And by the way, the number one sign to recognize that you're with someone who's willing to go the distance with you, their serious style relationship, is you say to them, hey, I bought this book or this book or this book. I mean, I got so many different books here. Let's read it together to actually enhance our relationship. How do you feel about that? What are you talking about? Our relationship is great. We don't need to do anything. Whoa, whoa. God. My point is someone who really wants to invest in a relationship will invest in making the relationship better. And anyone who gets confrontational or defensive is going to end up being a problematic person to be in relationship with. I tell my women clients, look, you have every right to ask for what you want. And if the guy has a problem with it, then he's not your guy and vice versa. But if you ask for wanting to improve the relationship through healthy mm. means, don't ever be afraid to ask for that because yes. this is your life. Here's the thing. Our job is almost less important than who we choose as a mate. Who we choose as a potential mate is most likely one of our biggest decisions in our life. Not buying a car, not buying a house, not even a job because jobs aren't even guaranteed anymore. But who you choose as a mate can directly affect your entire well-being. People are depressed because they choose the wrong partner in their life. And I'm here to say your one most empowered thing to do is to choose a partner who's aligned to who you are and what you want and wants to co-create something and not just passively enjoy your company. Yeah, definitely. And so finding signs that you are kind of both aligned by like reading the same books, it kind of gives you a good way to discuss the things about how to like solve your relationship and make it like a long-term thing. Yeah. It, it can be kind of hard to just sort of, you notice something that's wrong to just be like, oh, you're pointing it out that's wrong. But when you kind of, when you both come, out, come at it from the same understanding, if you both read the same paragraph, it's like, oh, if someone does this in, in the relationship, it's not healthy. The person knows that they've done that and like can recognize it. It's not a complaint. It's like, oh, this is how I can, can improve straight away. So yeah. it's really great to both be in the same point of view. For example, I could date a woman who's not into the books I'm into. I mean, she might like, you know, 
John Grisham or the Game of Thrones or whatever. Don't get me wrong. I would read those. But if I introduce these and she got defensive, then there's a problem. But if I introduce and she goes, wow, I really appreciate that. They don't have to have the background to be able to go forward, but they at least want to be curious enough to move forward from, again, a personal development, self-help and spiritual perspective, because that's the foundation to a healthy, happy relationship is our introspective work, is our emotional work, because those are the relationships that go the distance. Two questions I really like to ask are one, what is one of your earliest ever memories that is distinct? My earliest, you mean just any, just, just, just any memory. memory? It's a bit of a weird question, but I like. No, it's not a weird question because actually it's a memory that I've been butted up against a lot. It's the abandonment memory that I have when my mother and father and I were skiing when I was three and a half years old. And I thought my parents abandoned me. It became a script in my life. And then I went to the Hoffman process, which is an inner child workshop. And I explored this deeper. And then I went back to my parents and I talked to them about it before my mom passed, actually literally right before she passed. And she said, I was five feet away from you when this happened. And like, in, but to a little kid, I thought my mom abandoned me on the ski resort. And she goes, no, I was, well, she was 10 or 15 feet away. But in my world, that was a mile away. So that was one of the first memories I have. And I've explored this memory a lot. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Yeah, most people kind of have to search for a while, but you were like right on that. Again, I've done a lot of work to get there. So that's as far back as I can go. I think I remember my taking care of my brother. Maybe I was a little bit younger. I remember babysitting him once. So that's about the earliest memory, maybe three years old. Okay, cool. Then my other question I would like to ask is, what is one of the kindest things that someone has ever done for you? When my son passed away, so many people reached out with love for me, lots of love. My best friend came over to visit me the next morning and my life is shattered. And he goes, whatever you need, you've got. A couple of weeks later, I asked him for something and he didn't bat an eye. It's personal to share with the public, but let me just say, it was the kindest thing. I mean, I've had so many kind things, but that sticks out in my mind right now because that was just an expression of love. He goes, I got your back. I have so many kind things from my parents, my siblings, my family, all that kind of stuff, friends, but that one stands out to me because that was just pure love. Thanks. It's a big one. <laughs> Feeling a bit like Rachel and that was a nice thing to talk about. And then I guess, is there any parting number one pieces of advice for life that you feel people should know before you go? My t-shirt says self-love club. My book says what the heck is self-love. My invitation for anyone who feels any emotional distress in their life, chaos, upset, worry, fear, anything, invest in yourself. Because that's what self-love is. It's just merely investing in your emotional self. The physical world will take care of itself, but your emotional self is all you have. So my invitation for the book is to take you on a journey and beginning a daily practice of personal development, self-help and spiritual work as a vaccination to emotional chaos. And that's my invitation for anyone who's watching and listening to this show. Thank you so much for the time. It's been lovely interviewing you. Thank you. I've been honored. Really great. You're a great interviewer. I appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much for the compliment. <laughs> You're a great guest. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot for Jonathan coming on the show. What a legend. Relationships are funny things, but they are so essential to us as humans making our way in this confusing world. So wherever you are and whether you are in or out of love, I hope that you can reflect on life and enjoy it and be grateful for it. Life, after all, is to be enjoyed and that starts with today. So be kind to yourself and whilst you're at it, be kind to someone else too.